pray that they didn't take that serious or take that any other way than the fact that, you know what, life has experienced levels, and all of us are different, but we're all coming together that we might learn from one another, that we might be able to glean from one another. And as we do such, Lord, I pray that we would enact, just become more like you. That's the goal in life. It isn't to have the biggest house. It isn't to drive the nicest car. It isn't to look the best to have the appearance of looking the best, getting on social media and saying, look at me. I, it's not about being the most spiritual, but at the end of the day, it's about being the most mature in Christ, that we wouldn't be offended by small things, that we would be able to get over the little things in life, but most importantly, that we would come together as friends, as brothers, as sisters, as fathers, as mothers, as whatever needs be, that the church would fill them role that, Lord, we could be what the world is looking for, and we cannot be without you, because you're what they're looking for. And if we're to be your hands and feet, Lord, I pray that we would exemplify you, we would talk like you, we would act like you, but most important, we would walk in the power that you walked in, because the same spirit that was in you is in me, is in them. And we can do the things that you did. You told us that. So let us to realize that tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So, you know, when Pastor asked me to do this, there was something that's been stirring on my heart for a long time. And um, it, it really, it goes back to this. Everybody's seen the Irv Meyer video, right? Him doing something inappropriate with a young lady. And if you don't know, I'm, I'm an ex-football player. I played for 14 years. And so uh, that was what I really thought I was going to do. I thought I was going to go into college, and then from there I was going to figure everything out. I had opportunities to play uh, college football, and I just gave them up because I realized I, found in lo I fell in love with Christ. And when I did that, I realized that football wasn't as, as much of a need in my life as Christ was. And so I gave it all up because I wanted to be a pastor. And now here I am. And uh, you guys may be saying, Lord, you could have picked another church, but either way, I'm here. So we're going we're gonna to have some fun tonight, but most importantly, I pray that we learn. So anyway, so I, I watched Irv Meyer, and they had a bye week. And if you haven't seen the video, he was, doing, he was dancing with a young lady inappropriately. He's a married man. He should have been on the plane with his team, but instead... He was in a bar that he owns in Ohio, far away from his family, far away from his responsibilities, far away from the thing that he should have been doing in that moment, and he was distracted. And so tonight I just want to talk to you about in and out Now, in and out happens to be a restaurant that I am very fond of. I'm so grateful that they made some down in Katy. Every once in a while after church, I will take a drive all the way down to Katy just so I can enjoy a couple in and out burgers. And yes, I do indulge. I get two, and they're doubles, okay? So, <laughs> and I get the animal-style fries to go with it, and I pray for the Lord to forgive me of gluttony when I'm done, okay? I don't get to enjoy it all the time, so when I do, I overindulge, but one of the things I, I pastor sent me, and really what bring this to mind was pastor sent me a video, uh, uh, just a, a picture, and on the bottom of one of the in and out cups was go, let's go Brandon, and I couldn't help but just laugh at that. I just thought that's hilarious. If you've seen the meme, you know what they're talking about. But I just thought that was so funny, and I love in and out even more now. And so I want to talk to you guys about a very simple, simple fact. And this is that I'm the gatekeeper of my life. I'm the thing that allows things in, and I'm the thing that allows things out. When my mouth says something it shouldn't say, I allow that. And it happens. You guys witnessed this tonight, okay? It happens. But, you know, the reality is, is what goes in comes out. That's just a, a life lesson that we've all learned, right? And pastor says all the time, you know, garbage in, garbage out. He also says if he can get it to you, or if he can get it through you, he can get it to you, okay? That doesn't just apply with finances, okay? That applies with revelation. 
That applies with business ideas. That applies. Why? Because the Lord is so wanting his kingdom to come to pass on earth that he's willing to give that which is in heaven through his people. That's how he gets everything across. And so we are the gatekeepers of our lives. That's just the reality. We, God so allowed us to have free choice. And in that free choice, I get to make those choices. Now, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. And I live by the consequences or rewards of those decisions, right? And that's just a fact. I don't need the Bible to figure that out. We, we, we see that just in life. You make good decisions, life tends to go a little better for you. You make bad choices, life tends to get a little rough pretty quick, right? It's just how the world works because God's truths are not limited to the bible they're not limited to people that go to church his truths are truths across the board so people that don't even realize it that may not be believers in christ are still having to live by these same truths they just haven't been awakened to the fact that god has a purpose on their life to fulfill for his kingdom not their kingdom but I'm praying that we continue to live our lives in such a way that we bless them and they find their kingdom in Christ so that it could be channeled, funneled to the right place. So I'm the gatekeeper of my life. Gatekeepers were guards stationed for protection at various kinds of gates, which could be city gates, palace gates, or temple gates. Again, so it, these people weren't just set in front of a city. Okay, they weren't just set at the city gate. Why? Because some of the city people may not like what's going on in the temple, or they may not like what's going on in the, in the uh, palace. So they may stage a coup. They may try to kill off the leader. They may. So gatekeepers were set at all kinds of gates. And why? They wanted to control the inflow and the outflow. Just like us. We're to control the inflow, and we're to control the outflow. So. Ancient cities had high, thick walls around them to keep them, uh, keep the wild beasts out and the invading armies out. Heavy gates were set within those walls to allow entrance and exit. A gatekeeper had to be trustworthy and alert for any signs of trouble. A gatekeeper laxed in his duties could literally bring ruin upon an entire civilization. So the ideal of gatekeeper implies alertness and security. Uh, I'm thinking about this today, and, I, and I, as I'm just mauling over my thoughts, and I realize, man, can you imagine whole civilizations were taken by one bad gatekeeper? One bad gatekeeper, and a whole civilization, a whole city could be lost because one person. How much is that not true in our own lives? We get laxed in one thing, in one moment. And that whole thing can come crumbling down. One moment of just me saying, ah, I just don't want to. And bam, Ermeyer staying in Ohio when he should have been on the plane, should have been on the plane with his team. They've been losing. Look, right now is not the time to be doing your own thing. Y'all been losing. Stay with the team. Lose together, win together, right? No, nope. I got some business I want to attend to. Yeah, business should be winning. That should be your job right now. So how do I, how do I know that this is a theme that God wants us to see? Simple, David, right? So it says, I'm going to get ahead of myself here. I'm going to go ahead, and this is not in the notes. So this was just something I was just really pondering about today. It says the day and the hour are unknown. Okay, this is in Mark 13. We're going to start at 32. It says, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the sons, but the only the father. So it says be on guard. Again, what is that? Gatekeeper. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and he puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task. This is God. Jesus went away and he gave us assignments 
to bring heaven to earth. That's our assignment. He said, assign tests and tells the one at the door, keep watch. Keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you is, I say to everyone, watch. It's our job as believers to be watchful. One, to understand the times and the season. How can I be an effective ambassador of Christ if I don't understand the time and the season? How can I communicate the gospel if I don't, affect, don't understand the times and the season? Again, there have been a bunch of books come out. This is why Jesus has come back here. This is why Jesus come back here. This is why Jesus come back here. The reality is we can keep writing these books. We don't know when he's coming back. There are certain prophecies that have to be fulfilled. And again, we can be watchful, mindful, understanding that there is a time and there is a season when he comes back. But we do not get to know the hour that he's coming back. We can understand that it may be in this parameter, but we do not get to know when he's coming back. So when people say, oh, I know Jesus is coming back here, just say, okay. That's what I've learned to tell people. Okay. Because there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there to say, oh, man, listen, 88. The book came out. It was like number one seller in the Christian community. 88 reasons Jesus come back, 88. Well, 2022 almost, and he hadn't come yet. If he did, we missed it. Okay? We were just unaware. It's, it, it, don't allow yourself to get caught up in nonsense. Be watchful, be mindful, be understanding that what I let in comes out. So, when we have these opportunities, when we have these opportunities, we have to make sure that we're taking and making the most out of them. We have to be very watchful over the gates of our lives. What are the gates of our life? Very simple. Our mind, okay? our eyes, our mouth, our ears. Those are the gates of our life. And you say, well, with mind, it doesn't, you can't really open, but you can open your mind and you can have wild imaginations. I didn't have to see anything. I didn't have to hear anything. I didn't have to smell anything. I didn't have to do anything. It just allowed my mind to wonder and I'm, I'm coming up with scenarios that don't even exist. I went to take the garbage out, and man, the boogeyman jumped out the woods. He, he done took me away, put me in a dungeon, right? If we're not careful, we can have these wild imaginations. So it's a, it's a gate that we allow the enemy, or good or bad. Again, what I allow in comes out. So if I'm allowing crazy shows on TV or all these things, or hearing these crazy stories on Facebook or wherever, then guess what? Those wild imaginations. Have room to grow, okay? I, if I don't hear these crazy stories, I don't think, you know what, tomorrow I might get abducted. I just don't think those things because it's not even in there to be able to think those things, right? It, it's, on, it's on a seed. That's how the devil works. That's how things in our life work. He created us to be gardeners and we plant seeds and in those seeds come forth the fruit of our lives. As we plant them, they grow. As we water them, they grow. If I continue to think on crazy things, crazy things begin to happen. Crazy things begin to just spring forth out of my life. So we got to be careful with these wild imaginations. We got to be careful of the mind gate. We got to be careful of the ear gate. So our mouth gate it says Psalms 141, 1, 141, 3 it says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Who's the gatekeeper of my mouth? Me. Also, it says here, Lord, set a guard over my lips. So it's okay for us to pray according to his word. Lord, I need your help. Because the reality is some of us say stupid stuff. There are things that happen, and we say stupid stuff, okay? And it, it's just inevitable, right? It, it, it happens to everybody. Now, some of us may have more colorful language than others, but nevertheless, it's still the same. 
we're, we're expressing something out of our gate that isn't conducive to our well-being, okay? So our mouth gate, the eye gate, says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be filled with light. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be filled with light. What I watch has a huge determination. What I see has a huge determination of who I'm going to be. It's huge. It's like one of the biggest things. Hearing and, and seeing are huge parts of our life. In America, the mouth gate tends to be a bad one because we like to eat and we like to say things that we shouldn't. But for an overall, the eyes and the ears is how we get our perception, is how we get our actual perception. That's why he says walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because if I walk by sight, the things I see begin to determine the way I perceive it rather than by faith knowing that Christ is working in me and through me. Okay, so if I continue to think on these things, why? As a man thinketh, so he is. As a man speaketh, he thinketh. So if I'm saying something, then I'm thinking about it. And if I'm thinking about it, I'm becoming it. So we got to continue to watch our eyes because of what we see, we think about. What we hear, we think about. Ear gate. Isaiah 55, 3. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. So this is, this is huge. Incline your ear and come to me. There's, there's two things there. There's two uh, action words or two um, commands. Incline your ear. This is hard. This is sometimes it's hard for us. The, oh, wait, I have to stop what I'm doing. I have to let everything else go, and I have to incline my ear to you, Lord. Okay, that's hard for Americans, especially. So we got to incline our ear to hear. On top of that, I got to come. I got to go to you. What is that saying? One, it's surrender. I'm saying, Lord, I'm surrendering me, my time, my decisions, my hopes, my dreams, and I'm saying I'm coming to you so that you might be able to use me. We come to him. He says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. This is you. This isn't just for David. This is for HD right now. This is for David right now. He wants to make an everlasting covenant with you. He wants to spend time with you. Are you allowing that? My eye gate again. So that was our ear gate. It says on my eye gate, it says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. What does that mean? It means if I'm not careful, the thing that's causing me to sin will make me miss out on his purpose and his plans for my life. Not only that, the greatest purpose and plan of our life to spend with him forever and eternity. If we're not careful, we miss out on eternity forever for temporal things. That's why Moses' story is so incredible. He turned away the temporal things so that he could get everlasting things. As believers in America, this is probably one of the hardest things. I believe that in that time, the, the rich young ruler wasn't as much a talked about story as it is today. The reason being, there wasn't a lot of people that had more than enough. There wasn't a lot of people that were uh, this way or that way. It was very easy for them to be able to give up their stuff because they didn't have a lot, right? If I ain't got a lot, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, I got two sides. She want one, I'll take one. Yeah. It's pretty easy, right? So I think today's connection to the rich young ruler is greater than it's ever been because the reality is we have stuff. I mean, we have stuff. I mean, even me, I, I look through my house sometimes. I'm like, where did I get that from? Like, what, what is that? Like, why? And, and the reality is we just like grabbing stuff. We like taking stuff. We like, like, oh, I need 
10,000 bullets. I don't know, thousands is not enough. What if the zombie apocalypse come? I need 10,000 bullets, right? <laughs> Amen, you know? I mean, and, and, and it's all, here's if we're not careful, it's always fear driven, right? Well, my parents didn't have nothing, so I got to have. Or it's a status driven, right? So if, oh, well, this is, this is what it takes to look like I'm successful in America. So I got I to gotta have these things in order to look like I'm successful. And I got to have this so that I can, well, what if, and again, these are those wild imaginations. What if, it's not, it's, it's not a what if. Just live your life every single day. Like Pastor always says, one domino at a time. One domino at a time. Let's live life today for today. We're going to listen to this sermon, and then we're going to go watch the Astros win. Yes, Lord, in faith. They had to endure me, Lord. I pray that you give them hope at the end. <laughs> this day, Mind Gate. This is one of my favorites because there's, this is an easy place to get lost. Our minds is an easy place to get lost. Second Corinthians 10.5 simply says this, the world is unprincipled, unprincipled. This is in the message version. I really like it. Normally I don't use the message, but I just really like this version. It says the world is unprincipled. It's a dog eat dog world out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. And building lives of obedience into maturity. How do we get to be mature? Simple. Obey. Obey. So how do we get to be mature? We do what God said. He said, if you love me, you'll obey me. So all we got to do is love God and we become mature. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't just, just, oh, yay, I love you, Lord. Like I said on Sunday, right? I said, it's one thing for my wife to tell me she loves me. It's another for her to show me she loves me. It's one thing for you guys to say, oh, pastor, I appreciate you. And then that bucket come empty on Sunday. Why do I say it like that? Because the reality is we can't just continue as believers to let our mouth have empty words. Our mouth has to have life and life more abundant on it. If not, then the world won't see Christ as he really is. Because he sure isn't going to see him through our actions all the time. Because believe it or not, we're going to fall short. There are going to be some days that I don't live like I should. Or I, I misstep. I do something that causes somebody to be like, did you see what David did? I mean, you come hang out with me, you'll see. It happens a lot. It happens a lot. But the reality is it doesn't change God's mind about me. It doesn't change God's mind about you. It doesn't change God's mind about the fact that we were called for a purpose. The pastor talked about it on Sunday. We have a purpose. How do you get your 21-year-old out of bed when he doesn't want to? Simple, show him his purpose. It's amazing to me how many parents in this world, I can't get my son to do this. I can't get my daughter to do this. That's because they don't have a purpose. They haven't found it yet. Help them find it. You want to get... Nothing will drive a young man or a woman out of bed like purpose. Why? Because when they find their purpose, they find fulfillment. That's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for fulfillment in this life. We have to know that it meant for something, you know, other than me just getting stuff. That's cute. But the truth is, at the end of the day, that's why so many rich people are unhappy. is because there's not fulfillment in it because they're not living on purpose. If they were living on purpose, then there would be fulfillment in what they were doing. They wouldn't be unhappy. Their divorce rate wouldn't be higher than those of, of poor people. Poor people have to stick together so they can make it, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's just the truth. <laughs> Look, that's the reality. Rich people are like, hey, man, you go your way. I go my way. 50% looking pretty good. My wife would be like, I can't leave you. <laughs> I ain't got nothing. 
I'm, I can't leave you. I ain't got nothing either. I'm better to scratch these pennies together, you know? So the truth is we got to find our purpose in life because that's what gets us up out of bed. That's what causes us to realize that there's more to this life than what I've been listening to, what I've been hearing, what I've been seeing. What I've, why? Because if we're not careful, we're opening up the gates of our life. The easiest way to get distracted is only through our gates. It's the only way I ever get distracted from what I'm called to. What is distraction? Simple. It's me taking my eyes and my mind off of Christ. That's a distraction. Now, I'm not saying every distraction is bad because I love to hunt and fish. And I can find Christ in those things. But if I'm not careful, it can become a distraction. It can become the thing I live for. It can become the thing that I desire. Right? I like guns, but that's not the thing I live for. Somebody tomorrow, can, somebody asked me one time, David, what if the government came to take your gun? You can have them. The reality is my life isn't built around those guns. It's built to make sure my family has a dad, has a husband. If you think you're going to come to my house and take my guns, they're yours. Because I'm not going to get shot and leave my family without a dad or a, for a gun, for a thing. It's not worth it to me. I'm sorry. Now, I'm not saying that we should just be like sheep. But I am saying, listen, live to find another day. Okay? There's hope tomorrow because I realize in my life that there are greater things than stuff. My life can't be built around gathering and gathering and gathering more and more stuff. It's not enough. I'll never find fulfillment in a gun. I'll never find fulfillment in shooting the next big deer. I'll never find it. It's good. It's memories. It's things that God created us for the extra. It's, you know, when he said, I gave you life and life more abundant, that's more to abundant. But I can't build my life around more abundant. I have to build my life around him and his purposes for my life. So distractions come by only by way of our gates, our lives, our ears, our mouth, our eyes, our mind. The windows of our life. I heard Joseph say one time, he was talking about perspective. And I'll never forget this. It was, a good, it was a good story. He said that one day that there was a lady, she was watching her neighbor wash clothes, right? And you probably remember this. She was watching her neighbor wash clothes. She's looking, she's like, man, that lady's clothes real dingy, nasty kind of, you know, her whites ain't very white. She's looking through the window of her house and man, one of these days I'm going to have to tell her how to wash her clothes, right? She does it again a week later. She's like, man. Finally, this goes on for a few few weeks, whatever. So one day, she goes out and she's like, "Man, I'm gonna tell my neighbor, man, you need to learn some bleach, something, get you some Clorox, quit using that family dollar stuff, something. I don't know, whatever, you know, use some peroxide up in there, something. Get them whites white. What are you doing, dingy?" She goes to step outside, and when she does, she sees the whitest, prettiest clothes she ever seen. She's like, Wait, the problem was her perspective was wrong. Her window was dirty, and she's looking at them clothes, and she's saying, man, I, I thought because my lens of the way I wanted to see it was dirty. It wasn't through an actual lens. It was through a false lens. And in life, if we're not careful. Our perspective can have a huge control over our lives. And so the windows of our lives are our eyes. We know that. It's, it's how I see. But here's the other thing. It's like a one-way mirror right? Because I see out, but I can't see in. Other people see in, but I can't. Other people see things about me sometimes that I don't even see, right? And I'm like, ooh, dang, I wish somebody would have told me, like a booger on my face or something, you know? I can't see it. I can't see it, right? But somebody else talking to me, they're like, oh, you know, but they won't, they won't tell me, they're like, oh, I don't want to embarrass him. Yeah, I appreciate that. See, that's real love right there. Somebody love you, they tell you the truth, okay? People tell you, oh, they, can't. <laughs> they didn't love. No, listen, somebody tell you the truth, that's love, okay? You need that. You need those people in your lives because if you got a booger on your face, you look like dumb dumb. You don't need that, okay? <laughs> that's just reality, okay? You're walking around having a conversation with somebody, they're going, I can't hear a single word you're saying, right? Anything. This is just a, just a, a funny just observation. So 
we have to make sure that we have people in our lives that will tell us the truth. But there, the fact is that sometimes you guys see in my life what I can't see, and I can see in your life what you can't see. So we have to continue to build community, and we have to continue to love one another in such a way that it's not going to be offensive to me if H comes and says, hey, Meryl, you know, yesterday I heard you say something, man. I, I didn't think that was right. You called my wife old. I, I got a problem with that, okay? <laughs> You're right. I'm sorry. Sorry, H. I love, I love Ms. D. Sorry. So the reality is, but we have to be able to have that. We have to have mature believers, that, especially with young believers that may not understand always that they said or did something that was offensive to somebody else. How do we learn discretion? We see it in other people. How do we learn discernment? We see it in other people. So we have to have these windows open. And so one of the, the things I know about this is, again, talking about Herb Meyer. How do I know that God wanted us to see these things? It's wrapped up in 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 2. It says, it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings got out to go to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. But David remained at Jerusalem. He should have been out fighting the fight, fulfilling his purpose. But when we live our lives not on purpose, on purpose, when we live our lives not on purpose, what happens? Then it happened. One evening, David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was beautiful to behold. What happened? He got distracted. Why? Because he wasn't fulfilling that which was on his life to fulfill. He wasn't doing the responsibilities that God had set him up to fulfill. And when we do that, you see it all the time with pro athletes. Let them get off for a week. What happened? Just this week. Brooks. DUI. Why? He had a week off and now all of a sudden goes out with his buddies. Failure. DUI. Dude, you could lose millions of dollars to have a couple extra drinks. Just crazy, right? But in that moment, in that moment, it did not seem crazy. It did not seem crazy. It was just right there in a moment. That's why I say in a moment we could lose our lives. In a moment we could lose that which God called us to. Simply because we didn't want to fulfill that which God called us to. We weren't on purpose. We weren't on task. We weren't watchful. We have to be watchful. We have to protect these eye gates these ear gates and it's crazy but sometimes the best thing to do is turn the tv off sometimes the best thing to do is turn facebook off why because we're getting flooded i mean around the election time i'm t telling you i had to walk away from all that stuff because i got so tired of left and right i'm gonna be honest left and right because i didn't feel like none of them was right i felt like all of them was just about themselves and they were losing focus of the fact that listen we are one nation under god and we're indivisible as long as we're in unity. How was the church on the day of Pentecost so affected? Simply because they were gathered together in the upper room in one accord. How does a church become successful? It's built on community and they have the same ideas, the same focuses. And in their window of view, they're going the same way. That's how we grow the little country church. That's how we grow the kingdom of heaven. How? Simple. Fulfill your destiny and help others around you fulfill theirs. Don't be offended when somebody else gets a moment of success. Because in those moments, that's when you fail. God said, man, I can't even trust you with celebrating H's victory. I can't even trust you with celebrating, you know, whoever. I mean, it, you can put an X there. You can put any name you want. I don't care if they're, you feel like they're your enemy. Man, I'll, I'll celebrate them. Man, I'm happy for you. Why? Because I realize that it's not about my life, but it's about the kingdom of heaven. If somebody is winning people to Christ, as much as I don't like maybe the way they're doing it, or I don't necessarily agree with the way they're doing it, it does not matter because I can't let my mind be offended 
by what God is doing to somebody else's life. Otherwise, I'm going to miss it all on my own. I got to open myself up to realize that, man, my life is not my own. The moment I do that, the moment I can realize that, man, my, my gates are closed. They're, they're closed to the things that the world wants me to see. I can't allow myself to dwell on them. Fellowship. One of my favorite things to do in the world is just hang out with people. It really is. And, and a lot of times I get to do it by just working with people because I like to work. But it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. So become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. Disaster and trap sinners. But God's loyal people get a good life. A good life gets passed on to the grandchildren. A good life gets passed on to the grandchildren. I've always said this. I want my ceiling to be my kid's floor. I want my kids to be successful in a way that I could never be successful, but I set them up to be able to be that in their spiritual walk, in their businesses, in their minds, in their decision making. I want everything that I've done in this earth to accumulate to where they can literally stand on my shoulder and say, thank you, Dad. You lived a life that allowed me to be more successful, that allowed me to fulfill the purposes on my life. We have to live that way. We have to live multi-generational. If we don't, it dies with us. And we're starting to see a little bit of that. And at times I worry a little bit because I'm like, man, don't understand sometimes lord you've got to give me understanding because i just don't get the way they think but the reality is they still have a purpose they have to think the way they think otherwise they wouldn't be able to communicate the gospel to the people that think that they have to be exposed to certain things otherwise they won't be able to communicate the gospel to the people that are exposed that way and sometimes i get frustrated with influencers because i'm like you guys say nothing you got 20 million people following you. You go around doing dumb things. 20 million people following you. You got people doing stupid challenges, fulfilling nothing in life, and yet you have a greater voice in the church today. Why? And all I can say is this. When God gets back in the church, we get out of the way. We say, you know what, God, it's about you. And we let personalities die. We let desires and titles die when we let those things go jesus will be like a book i love it's called god chasers he said the reason bethel became so popular in the bible was because it meant there was bread in the house hungry people are looking they're looking for bread in the house the reality is can we become a bethel again can we become a place where people are saying there's living bread there, there's living water that only happens when we let Jesus come back into the church? When we get out of the way, and it's not about us, it's not about preaching styles, it's not about singing styles, or it's not about whatever, the latest, greatest lights, it's not about the games, it's not about anything else other than we just want Jesus to come back to the church in America. When we do those things, I'm telling you, people will, you won't have enough pews in a chair, in a, in a church. You won't have enough seats in a church. It's not going to happen. These churches will fill up faster than anything you've ever seen. There's a reason that in Indonesia and China and all these other places that they will have church in underground China. They will not even say that they're having church. 10,000 people will show up because they're hungry, D. They're hungry, eight. They're hungry. What would happen in America if we didn't care about the stuff? We didn't care about the pews. We didn't care about the lights. We didn't care if the AC worked or if it didn't work. The heater came on if it didn't come on. There was pews if there wasn't pews. I almost wondered, like, sometimes I, I, I want to tell Pastor, look, let's just take all the pews out and just have nothing. Why? Because, it, look, that's, they, they'll meet in fields around the world. They don't care. I'll stand for hours. People, 
when Jesus was here, he didn't need a publicist. He didn't need somebody to go ahead of him, say, hey, Jesus is getting ready to come to your city. This is where I stand. This is why I'm not, look, I'm not knocking Facebook. I'm not knocking any, any promotions that we do. I'm not knocking any of this stuff. But I know this one thing. When Jesus truly shows up somewhere, you don't have to have a promoter. You don't have to hit the boost button on Facebook. You don't have, listen, it will spread faster than you can. It will spread faster than the internet. You want to talk about viral. Let Jesus show up in one meeting, and I promise you, for a, a month, you won't have room enough to come. You're going to be getting here an hour early to make sure there's a seat. Why? Jesus showed up in the cities, and thousands of people showed up because they knew that which I've been looking for is there. So all I'm saying is let this church let this church be like a beacon. Let this church be an example. Let this church be one that we're not so worried about. Did I get enough likes? Did I get enough this? Did I get enough that? And instead, we block our eye gates and we block our ear gates and we to the fact that, Lord, you know what? I want to be a holy people. All that means is set apart. It's not about me being more self-righteous. I can't be righteous enough because it's like dirty rags to him. It's not in me to even be able to be good enough to be God like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm accepting you because you were a good boy. I can't do enough to get there. It's only by the blood of Christ. And so I say to this church tonight, we don't know the day and the hour, but we can all be ready right now. We can all be ready right now. Not because I'm so great. Not because I'm, I've read my Bible enough. Not because, no, I'm not knocking any of that. My God, we all need more word. That's what washes us. Is what gives us better perspective. So that when we see things, we're not seeing it dirty, but instead we're seeing it through the lens of Christ. We all need that more. We need to be washed. We need the word. But what we need most is just Christ in our life to have communion with God again. When we have communion with God, it will forever change our destinies. It will put us on purpose. He's a light unto our feet and a light unto our path. That's what I need. I need, I need him to light my path so that I can help you on yours. If I'm lost, can't help you. If you're lost, you can't help me. We got to be on purpose together. That this church isn't separated from the other church, isn't separated from the church down the road. We're not in competition. We're in union because we're all the bridegroom. We're all the bridegroom. We're all the bride. And I say yes to him. And so tonight I just pray. Look, I, I know it's kind of weird, kind of a different way of communicating, but like I, I started looking at this, I thought, man, this is what I need, Lord. Just need to realize that it's my eye gates, it's my ear gates. I've allowed them to be opened up to things that I shouldn't have. So I'm going to pray tonight, and we're going to get out of here and watch some Astros whoop some booty. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I just pray that tonight, under the sound of my voice, that people would recognize, Lord, I am the gatekeeper of my life. I do hold the destiny of my own life, but, Lord, I also know that sometimes I need to help up. That my brothers and my sisters aren't my competition, but they're my right guard and my rear guard and my left guard and my foreguard because they go with me on our path to finding you, that we all become more mature believers in Christ. That it's not about me and my giftings. It's not about my communication gift. It's not about anything in my life, but it's about the fact that the Son of Christ, the Son of God came down and he died on the cross for me, for them. That I can't do anything outside of you, Lord. And so, Lord, I put my trust, I put my faith, I put my hope in you. And I just say, Lord, I pray that you bless every single person in here. I pray that you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I pray that you would overflow every single person's lives. And that, Lord, one another would begin to celebrate with one another. Not say, oh, wow, did you see what they did? But rather, they would give grace when needed. They would show love of Christ every single place they go so that other people might say for the first time, man, you know what, I've, I've met a lot of Christians 
but I've never met one like you. I've never seen one that actually had the love of Christ in their life. I've never seen one that actually acted out that which the other ones talked about. Lord, let us to be more than just words. Let us to be more than just empty words. But let our love flow from our mouth, from our eyes, through our hands, through our feet. And that, Lord, other people would begin to know and feel you for the first time. That there would be bread back in this house. That not just in this house, but in every house across the nation, every house across the world, that people would come and they would find for the very first time that which they were born to find. And his name is Jesus. That it wouldn't be about us. It wouldn't be about the things that we want. It wouldn't be about stuff. But it would be about your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because we do need earth like heaven. Lord, we've seen enough earth like earth. Lord, let us now to pray that your will be done, Father God. So this earth might be cleansed. So this earth might find its redeemer once again knowing that you're the only answer that ever gave fulfillment to anything. You're the only one that had the true answer. I may find a lot of solutions out there, but I never found an answer like you. My stuff isn't greater than you. You're greater than my stuff. I give it all to you now, Lord. I surrender my life, and I pray that everybody in here surrenders their lives, recognizing, Lord, it's not about this life. It's about the next. It's about who can I get to come with me to the next. About being an ambassador for Christ like I've never been before. Lord, if you can get it through me, you can, if you can get it to me, you can get it through me. Lord, let revelation flow from my mouth. Let wisdom flow from my mouth. Let understanding flow from my mouth so that others might gain it as well. We thank you, Lord, because we know as we pray tonight, as we've communicated tonight, Lord, you're going to begin to be that guard over our lips, to be that guard over our eyes, to be that guard over our ears. When we hear things that we know aren't of you, Lord, let us walk away. Let us to flip them windows of nonsense off in our lives so that we would hear and see correctly. We wouldn't see according to the lens of the world, but we would see according to the lens of the word of God. By your blood, Lord, you cleanse our lives. So cleanse us tonight. Make us more like you. Let us to be on fire and passionate once again. That we wouldn't stop to the left or to the right. But Lord, we would keep our eyes focused on you. Nothing can distract us. Nothing can hinder us. Because we know what we're about. And we know that we live on purpose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. I love you guys. I'm grateful for you. I pray that you got something. Go Astros. Uh Uh-oh.